Those of you who were here last night uh, were uh, treated by our first session that went really, really well, and we really enjoyed Dr. Strauss. Um, I'll just uh, say a word or two about him as far as introduction today. Um, I found out Dr. Strauss was born in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, where, where my two sons were born. Uh, his father was a pastor. His grandfather was a preacher. He comes from a lineage of, of, of godly men who serve the Lord. Uh, he spent a little bit of time in Alabama when his dad was pastor. And then I think you said age 12, your family moved to California, and that's been home ever since. Um, he went to Aberdeen to get his Ph.D., uh, and finished in 93, 1993, two, and then you started the next year at Bethel in 1993 and been the university professor of New Testament. Um, I mentioned the textbook, uh, Four Portraits on Jesus, that much of, I think, what uh, we're hearing today agrees with what you wrote here, is it thankful? <laughs> um, and I just learned that there's a second edition coming out in March. So I really look forward to, to getting that. Um, uh, another book uh, that he has published is The Zondervan Exegetical Commentary of the New Testament on the Gospel of Mark. So this is a man who has spent a lot of time in the Gospels. Uh, if you go to his website, marklstrauss.com, um, you'll see just innumerable uh, book reviews, articles that he's written. Um, there's all, he, he's... He's famous uh, as a movie star, too. He's got a lot of uh, videotaping up there, so he's not shy of the camera. But uh, we're uh, thankful that he's on camera here today. We, we had people uh, watching remotely last night. I had some messages uh, that were grateful for what they heard. And I know that uh, you're going to be in for a treat today. Afterwards, there will be some light refreshments uh, in the fireside room. Again, if you want to stay around and visit, uh, engage in conversation and question and answer. Um, at the 11 o'clock hour, some of us, unfortunately, or fortunately, get to go to back to class. And so um, those of us who, who can stay around and visit, you're invited to do so. So welcome Dr. Strauss as he comes this morning, please. Thanks, Steve. Dr. Booth. <laughs> um, this has been a delight already. Um, I've been treated to great Canadian hospitality and I'm practically ready to move up here, but... My wife loves the desert dry climate, so she keeps saying, you can go, but you'll have to go alone. She'll keep telling me, so. and that's not going to happen, so, um, of course. So it's my joy to continue to share. Um, as Dr. Booth mentioned, um, if you're interested in um, downloading the outline for the material we, we covered last night and then we'll be covering for the next four sessions, I posted the outline. It's available in the back as well but some people might want it electronically if they wanted to add material to it as well. I'm also happy to, um, to make the uh, PowerPoints available if there's things there that you saw and missed and are interested in, in picking that up. So um, we're, we're just gonna move through the Gospels. We, last night we introduced the four Gospels, uh, way, the way we should read them. We introduced them as historical narrative motivated by theological concerns. And one of the things I most emphasized was that the Holy Spirit inspired four Gospels. And so we should read four Gospels. Um, evangelicals, uh, conservative Christians, have had a tendency to be the ones to most harmonize the Gospels, to bring them together into a single story. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but you're taking four Holy Spirit-inspired masterpieces and you're cutting and pasting them up. Don't forget, you're cutting and pasting the Holy Spirit's work and you're pasting them together into a man-made document, basically. And so I would strongly encourage you in your teaching and preaching to read the Gospels individually. Listen to the Spirit-inspired voice in each. When we're doing apologetics, when we're defending the historicity of these events, then harmonization has a role. But in terms of our teaching, our preaching, our personal study, I'd strongly encourage you to follow the plot line of each of the, the narratives, to, to hear how the characters are presented and developed. Um, and most importantly, to determine the portrait of Jesus that arises in these four Gospels. So we're going to do that. We're going to start with Mark's Gospel, not because of its name, uh, my namesake, but because most scholars consider it to be the first Gospel to have been written. And I would agree with that. I think it probably was the first of the four written, and I do think Matthew and, and Luke both used it as one of their sources. So it's a logical kind of a progress to start with Mark and then to see what Matthew and Luke have done with Mark and with additional sources. Uh, starting with Mark can be a little bit dangerous, though. Mark is the strangest of the Gospels as well. 
I was just shared this wonderful little poem about Mark. I want to read this poem because it's, it's so powerful. It picks up this idea of um, taken from the, these images of the, the, the various um, living creatures that appear in both Revelation and, and Ezekiel. Um, but Mark has been identified with the winged lion of that. And there's a little poem here by Malcolm Guite. Is that how you say it? Oh, it's Guite. It's Malcolm Guite. G-U-I-T-E. About Mark. And I just thought I'd read this to you as we, as we start off. It, it says, Mark, a winged lion, swift, immediate. Mark is the gospel of the sudden shift. From first to last, from grand to intimate, from strength to weakness, from debt to gift. From a wide desert's haunted emptiness to a close city's fervid atmosphere. From a voice crying in the wilderness to angels in an empty sepulcher. And Christ makes the most sudden shift of all. From swift action as a strong Messiah, casting the very demons back to hell. To slow pain and death as a pariah. We see our Savior's life and death unmade and flee his tomb dumbfounded and afraid. What is interesting is that's my lecture. You're all dismissed at this point. So it's just, that is really a powerful description. And obviously someone who's done a lot of work, a lot of work in the gospels. But as I said, Marx is the strangest in many ways, the strangest of the gospels. Uh, you have Jesus constantly telling people not to tell others that he's the Messiah, to keep it quiet. Why would he possibly keep this wonderful good news quiet that he's the Messiah? He tells his disciples to keep it quiet. He tells those who are healed to keep it quiet. He silences demons who are proclaiming him to be the, the Messiah, right? So, so Mark is strange in the, what we call the messianic secret. Um, it's strange at one point he does a partial healing. He doesn't seem to quite get it right the first time. There's a blind man, he heals him, and the blind man says, I see people wandering around, but they look like trees. Oh, Jesus says, let me fine-tune that healing a little bit. It's a very, very strange episode there. Jesus goes to his hometown and Mark says he could not do many miracles there because they had no faith. Could not. This is the Son of God. This is the one who can do miracles anytime, anywhere, any place. And yet he could not do miracles there. Uh, Mark's Gospel has a strange scene in the Garden of Gethsemane where um, the, the soldiers show up with Judas and Mark says everyone fled away. And then he tells the story of some naked young guy who was there in a sheet. What? We don't even know who this guy is. He just shows up out of nowhere, and then he, he flees. They grab the sheet off his back, and he flees naked. And, and we're just puzzled by this instant. Mark has the weirdest ending of the Gospels. It ends with the women discovering the empty tomb, and then they, they depart from there. They get an announcement of the resurrection, but they depart, depart from there afraid, and they tell no one anything at that point. And Mark's Gospel in our earliest manuscripts um, ends at that point. So... The most unusual of, of the four Gospels, certainly. But what I have discovered in my study of Mark's Gospel is that the deeper you go in Mark's Gospel, the more those, those strangeness become profound insights into who Jesus is and what he came to accomplish. I mentioned last night, Mark's is the most dramatic of the Gospels as well. We'll look at some examples of that. So let's, we're going to look especially at Mark's Christology, the portrait of Jesus in Mark's Gospel. And Mark's Gospel is simply outlined. With each of the four Gospels, I'm going to kind of give you a, a basic way to understand how the flow of the narrative goes. And Mark's um, Gospel has really a twofold out, outline. Some have, have called it a play in three acts, but you can make those three acts into two if we're looking at sort of the Christology of Mark's Gospel. And the first half are the mighty deeds of the powerful Son of God, or the mighty deeds of the powerful Messiah, or Jesus demonstrates he's the Messiah through his acts of incredible authority. The key word in the first half of Mark's gospel is authority. Authority. Jesus demonstrates authority in healings, authority in casting out demons, authority in, in raising the dead and healing the sick, authority in calming the seas. Remarkable authority. But then the midpoint of the gospel, we get a dramatic shift where Peter recognized that Jesus is the Messiah um, the disciples recognize this, but at that point, Jesus predicts he's going to suffer and die. And the whole second half of Mark's gospel is about the suffering role, or we could say the suffering way of the Messiah, of the servant of the Lord, um, of the Son of God. And so what I want to do, we're going to walk through the two halves of that. Um, 
the mighty deeds of the powerful Son of God, and then the suffering role of the servant. And I wanna, I'm going to just move through these passages, reading brief excerpts. Some of them will come up on, so I'd encourage you to have your Bible, um, open it up at this point. So the, the first half of the Gospel, the authority of the Messiah, authority in words and deeds. We can start with Jesus' authoritative message. Um, after, putting, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of, of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Now that phrase, kingdom of God, we use it a lot. Um, and we tend to use it now as kind of just a term for the gospel, for the good news. Right? We're going to have a barbecue and proclaim and advance the kingdom of God. In the first century, for Jesus to proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand was a, was a radical statement. A little bit more like the, the guy on the corner that has the end of the world is near. You know, a big sign proclaiming the end of the world is near. This is a radical claim. Jesus is claiming to be the one to inaugurate God's kingdom, to reestablish God's authority on earth. A remarkable, remarkable claim. Authoritative message, the kingdom of God. Jesus demonstrates authority in calling and appointing the disciples. Um, in Judaism, for the most part, when someone wanted to follow a rabbi, become a disciple to a rabbi, they would go to the rabbi and, and ask if they would become an apprentice. There'd be a period of testing, and then the rabbi would welcome them in. So, so the student normally would come or be sent by his family uh, to, to the rabbi. Uh, Jesus does something really unusual. He goes out and he calls disciples. He, he chooses them, and he, and he chooses, as you well know, sort of the riffraff of society. He doesn't choose the best and the brightest, you know, the, the, that star student who was, everyone's saying, well, he's going to be the chief rabbi in the town. Instead, he calls fishermen and tax collectors and, 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 and all of these things. And what's amazing is Jesus is walking along and he calls them and they leave everything and follow him. I was watching a, a video on Jesus uh, done by critical scholars and, and one of them was talking about these scenes and says, you know, in Mark's gospel, uh, especially in Mark's Gospel, it's almost as though these are zombie disciples, right? Jesus walks along, he says, come follow me. And it's like, they get up and they just, you know, and they just follow him. And, and he said, it probably wasn't actually like that. In fact, if we look at the four Gospels and harmonize them, we see that these disciples probably gradually came to know Jesus. And, you know, and there's, there's several different calls of the disciples. Peter is called three times, if you look at the, the, three, the, the, the four different Gospels. So most likely what happened is they saw Jesus' miracles, they heard his teaching, and then at some point they decided they are going to leave everything. And that's historically, that's true. But in Mark's gospel, Mark wants you to see zombie disciples, right? Mark, because what, what happens here? Jesus walking by the sea, right? These fishermen are just doing their business. Jesus says, come follow me. They drop everything and follow him. That's authority. That's what Mark wants us to see. I mean, I'm joking about the zombie disciples. He wants us to see that this man speaks and people immediately, immediately follow him. Authority and calling, and then appointing the disciples. In chapter 3, it says he appointed 12 that they might be with him. I love that. There's the key model for discipleship. Discipleship is not enrolling in a three-year discipleship class. Discipleship is being with Jesus, right? Learning from him, watching him. And then he calls 12, right? Jesus calls 12. And we all know that's an enormously significant number in Judaism. Twelve represents clearly the twelve tribes of Israel. So in some sense, Jesus is reconstituting the twelve tribes of Israel. What's amazing, too, it's, we sometimes don't notice this, Jesus didn't call eleven. If he was reconstituting the tribes of Israel and he was part of that, we would expect him to call eleven and then he would be the twelve and you'd have the twelve tribes. Instead, he calls twelve. Who calls the twelve tribes of Israel into existence? God himself. So there's an act of extraordinary authority when Jesus calls 12 and in a sense is reconstituting, bringing together the restored remnant of Israel, the reconstituted people of God. So authority in calling and appointing disciples. Third, authority in teaching. They come to Capernaum, which is Jesus' base of operations in Galilee. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Jesus at this point is getting a reputation as a rabbi, as a gifted speaker. Um, in Judaism, um, they did not generally have a full-time pastor in a synagogue. Instead, qualified males would be invited to give the homily or sermon. And Jesus does that a number of times in the Gospels. But notice this, the people were amazed at his teaching. Now, amazement is a key theme in Mark's Gospel. He uses like six different Greek words for amazement. 
Um, Jesus, the people were amazed. The people were marveled. The people were shocked. All of these different terms for amazement. Keep your eye open for those when you're, when you're reading uh, through the Gospel of Mark. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had, here's our word, right? One who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. The scribes or teachers of the law would repeat the traditions before them. They'd, they'd say, Rabbi so-and-so said this. Rabbi so-and-so said this. Jesus spoke with his own authority, speaking as the spokesperson for God himself, not as the teachers of the law. So authority in teaching. Fourth, authority in exorcism and healing. Same episode, same scene. Jesus is teaching in the Capernaum synagogue. Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now notice this. It's really interesting. How many demons are present at this point? It says he was possessed by an evil spirit. There's only one demon present, according to the account. But notice how the demon speaks. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Now, he can't be speaking about himself and the man he's possessing, because he knows Jesus isn't there to destroy the man, right? So who's he speaking for? The demon is speaking for the demonic hordes, right? For, for the legions of, of demons. They know he's here. They know the Messiah is coming. And the whole body of demons are trembling in fear. Have you come to destroy us? Uh, we said last night, Mark sets the whole of Jesus' ministry in, in the context of spiritual warfare. This is not just a human struggle between human enemies. This is a spiritual struggle on the cosmic level. So he says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Sometimes um, in the ancient world, if you knew the name or if you knew who a, a spiritual force was, you could gain control over it by naming them. So something, this demon is trying to gain control over Jesus by saying, I know who you are. But look at Jesus. Be quiet. There's the messianic secret right there. Don't, don't speak, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently, came out of him with a shriek. The response, the people, here it is, were all, what? Once again, were all amazed and they asked each other, what is this? Now, what would you say at this point? What is this? An amazing exorcism. He casts out demons. Instead, the first thing they say, what is this? New teaching. And with authority. He speaks with authority. He even gives orders to evil spirits and they obey him. It's really interesting. It's the message that's most important. The proclamation of the kingdom of God. The miracles, the signs, are evidence that the message is true. They're pointing out the reality that the kingdom of God is breaking in on human history is confirmed by the miracles. But the miracles in that sense are secondary. And Mark gets, gets it right here with reference to the people. They said, this is amazing new teaching that the kingdom of God is breaking in on human history. So, so um, authority in casting out demons and healing. Here's letter E, number five. Divine authority to forgive sins. Uh, we come, after a series of miracle stories, we come to a series of five um, controversy stories. The first one, is the healing of a paralyzed man. We all know the scene, an amazing scene. Some men come to Jesus. They're bringing to him a friend. They can't get in. The, the house is so crowded, they can't get in. So they tear up the roof. In our cultural context, we think, you did what? Right? Because we think of tiles or shingles or something like that. Um, in, in that context, it was generally a, a flat roof that would have planks or boards across the top with a, a thatch and then mud on top of the thatch. And so in, in Mark, it actually says they dug through the roof, which makes sense in that, in that context. Luke tells they, they moved the tiles so that his, his readers would understand what, what they're doing. But they open up the roof and they drop the man down. Now, what's interesting is, is whose house was this? We don't know whose house this was, but, but Jesus always stayed with Peter when he was in Capernaum. That was his base of operation. This could well be Peter's house. So we can imagine Peter going, hey, wait a minute, you know, what's going on as the, as the dirt rained down? Uh, but Jesus is impressed that they would, they would break up the roof in order to get their friend to him. When Jesus saw their faith, it's interesting, their faith, the faith of the friends, maybe also the man as well, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now this is shocking because what is everyone expecting? Everyone's expecting him to say, rise up and walk because Jesus is getting a reputation as a, as a healer. And the religious leaders are shocked by this. Some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now there's irony here. Mark's gospel, by the way, is full of irony. Mark and John in particular have enormous irony. But, but, so what are they doing? They're saying he's 
right? He's blaspheming. He's not God. Meanwhile, what is Jesus doing? He's reading their minds, right? In other words, he's demonstrating an attribute of God as they're accusing him of blasphemy. Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. He said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Now, again, there's, there's sort of an irony here. Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or take up your mat and walk? Well, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven, right? I can do that. Steve, your sins are forgiven. I'm going to get stoned if I keep that up. Right, right, right. But to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, you have to demonstrate it. Then you have to prove the, the power that, that you're able actually to heal. So Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority, there's our word, authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. Look at their response. This amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Now, if we'd have time, I'd go into this question of who could forgive sins except God alone, because it really is a fascinating theological question. Um, they say, who can forgive sins but God alone? And I always raise the question with my students is, can God forgive sins? Can God just fiat, just to say your sins are forgiven? Well, we would say, at first sight, we say, of course he could. But if that's the case, why did Jesus have to die? See, God is a perfectly just God, and God has to satisfy his nature. His very nature means that there must be a payment for the sin. And so Jesus, when he's forgiving sin, is forgiving sins proleptically in anticipation of his death on the cross. Already, Mark is looking forward to that death on the cross at this point. I'd love to go into that. We don't have time. We'll, we'll do that right? maybe in Q&A um, afterwards. All right, authority over the law. Sixth, authority over the law. Uh, it's two episodes in particular where Jesus seems in some ways to demonstrate authority over the Old Testament law. First one, healing, uh, Lord of the Sabbath. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields as his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. The disciples said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? When we first read this episode, sometimes we think that they're stealing, right? They're taking grain when they shouldn't be. But in fact, that's not the point. Um, in Leviticus, it allows you, if you're walking through your neighbor's grain field and you're hungry, lunchtime or snack time, you can, you can pluck off heads of grain and, and, and eat them. There's, there's no problem. It's, it's, it, you're, not, you're not stealing in a context like that. It says, it's interesting, it then says, but don't bring a sickle, right? <laughs> you're not allowed to bring a sickle. You're not allowed to, to, to I, hey, let's take you know, next week's lunch too, too. You're not allowed to do that. But, uh, so the, the disciples aren't accuse, accusing them of stealing. They're accusing them of breaking the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath. And, this would be, and by taking grain, they are harvesting. Here's the Sabbath commandment. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it must be put to death. This is a serious offense they're accusing the disciples of. Jesus tells a story, an Old Testament story. He said, have you never read what David did? When he and his companions were hungry and in need in the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some of, to his companions. This is an episode from 1 Samuel 21, when David is on the run from Saul, and he goes to the tabernacle, and he eats the consecrated bread. Um, and then Jesus draws application from that. He says, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for people, or man, not, not people for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created by God to bless humanity, not to, to, to put bonds around them, not to restrict them, but to, to, to bless them. And so human good takes precedent over the legalism that could be attached to the Sabbath. And so David was in the right by eating this bread because he and his men could have starved if they hadn't. Um, but then Jesus adds a second pronouncement. He says, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, son of man means human being in Hebrew. And so this could just be a, a repetition of the same. The Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. So people have authority over the Sabbath if it's for the good of their, if them, if it's for the purpose God created. But of course, there's more to it than that, isn't there? Because Jesus has identified himself as the son of man, that, that glorious messianic figure from Daniel chapter 7. So he is claiming authority over the Sabbath. Who created the Sabbath? God himself created the Sabbath. Now Jesus is claiming the, authority, the divine authority of God to, 
to, to overrule, in one sense, the Sabbath. Now the story of David becomes even more significant, because who was David? David was the Lord's anointed one. So it's, it was, it's not just the fact that David was a human being with needs, and so the Sabbath could be overruled in that sense. It's that he was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. So he has authority in that context. So Jesus is claiming unique authority there. What are we, seventh or eighth? I don't know what G is. We'd have to... Authority over nature, calming the sea. We see a number of nature miracles. That day when evening came, he said to the disciples, let us go to the other side. A furious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. So a storm breaks out on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus is asleep on a cushion. Why is Jesus sleeping? Why is Jesus sleeping? He's tired, thank you, right? That's why I sleep. He's tired, right? He's human. So we get a glimpse of his humanity here. Jesus is fully human. So he's exhausted, right? The pace that they're keeping up. I think he's also trusting God. There's also a sense that you can rest because you're trusting God. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down. It was completely calm. Now, we've read this passage so much, we go, yeah, that's kind of cool, right? But imagine, right? Imagine you've got a, a storm just pouring, and, and you're supposed to have a picnic. You know, it's all set up for the barbecue, and, and, and Dr. Booth goes out, and he says, I'll take care of this. Quiet! Right? And it stops, and the sun comes out, and you're suddenly in 75-degree weather, right? It's San Diego. All the, all the sun, right? You would go, who is this guy, right? Right? That's what the disciples say, right? He said to the disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, I don't think he's from around here, right? <laughs> Who is this guy? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And now when they said that, that has such Old Testament precedent, right? Here's Psalm 65, 5. You answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness, O God, our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the far of the seas, who form the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves and the turmoil of the nations. Psalm 89, 9. You rule over the surging sea. With its wa when its waves mount up, you still them. Psalm 107, 23. This is, almost a, par this is a, almost a parable in describing what happens here in Mark. Others went out to the ship on the sh uh, out on the sea in ships, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord, Yahweh, right? The disciples are crying out to Jesus. In their trouble, he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. It's interesting because some scholars say, well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, especially Mark, has no divine Christology. In other words, there's Presented, Jesus presented as a merely human Messiah. And then you see this kind of implications. Uh, Mark's strongest emphasis on Jesus as the Messiah, as the king, as the anointed one. But there's all this implicit divine Christology running below the surface. You can see it in a, in a passage like this. All right, the, the climax of this, right? All this, we get authority, authority, authority. The disciples are watching all this. The climax of this comes in chapter 8, when Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. Here's our episode. Jesus wants to get his disciples away for a time of spiritual retreat. They went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi in the north, north of Galilee. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, who at this point has been executed. Others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter, having seen all of these things, all of the miracles, all the signs, all of this, this evidence, he says, you are the Messiah. He gets it right. He acknowledges and recognizes that, that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the key turning point in Mark's gospel, the key axis on which the whole gospel turns. Up until this point, we've been seeing the authority of the Messiah. Authority, authority, amazement, amazement. Now, Peter gets it, right? Based on all he has seen, Peter says, you are the Messiah. Now, in Matthew, Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Um, he doesn't say that in Mark's gospel because Mark wants us to see all the miracles, all the authority as the evidence, the demonstration that Jesus is the Messiah. So we finally reach that conclusion, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. There's that messianic secret. 
Why? And I, we get a hint at why the, se- the messianic secret. He then began to teach them the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. He must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, why is Peter rebuking Jesus? Well, think of, think of Peter's perspective, right? He says, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah. What's the Messiah going to do? The Messiah is going to march on Jerusalem, going to challenge the Roman legions, going to establish the kingdom. Right? And Jesus says, the Messiah is going to suffer and die. Peter says, no, you're going to win, right? You know, in other words, he thinks Jesus is being defeatist. It's like, you know, this is going to be a tough struggle, and I might just die in this struggle. Peter goes, no, you're not going to die. But Peter's missing the point. He spoke plainly. Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter right back. And then he says something shocking. Get behind me, Satan. It's never good when Jesus calls you Satan, by the way. That's not a good point, uh, sign at, the, at this point. Why did he, does he call him Satan? What is Satan's plan? Think back at the temptation account in Matthew and Luke in particular, right? You don't need to go to the cross, right? All you got to do is worship me and I'm going to give you all of this, right? I'm going to give you the reign that the Messiah is, is to have. You just avoid the cross, right? So what does Peter say? Peter says, you're not going to die. He says, if I don't die no salvation will be accomplished. That is satanic. That's the satanic attempt to earn salvation, to earn the kingdom. So get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. It's a, it's a human desire to conquer the Romans, to establish God's kingdom in that way, rather than through suffering and death. But Mark knows, and, and he's going to reveal through the whole second half of the gospel, that the way to vindication, the way to success, the, the way to vi- victory is through suffering and and death. And so the second half of the gospel we call the suffering way of the Messiah. And the key axis upon which the whole gospel turns is Peter's confession. So we've seen the mighty deeds of the powerful Son of God. Now the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. Some of my notes it says the suffering role of the Son of God. And Son of God is a key title, so I go, go back and forth on that. Um, though Jesus is the all-powerful Son of God, his role at his first coming is not to conquer, he's not to conquer human enemies, but to suffer and die as the servant of the Lord. Isaiah 53, and there's echoes of Isaiah 53 in these passages. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And this really summarizes the central theme of Mark's gospel. Jesus as the suffering servant of the Lord. This last phrase is from verse, verse 11. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. He will bear their iniquities. Justify the many. It, that is echoed in, in what we are, we're going to get to as the key thematic verse of Mark's gospel. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, so the many, the many doesn't mean, in, in this context, the many means the one dying for the many. It doesn't mean many, but not all in, this, in, in that context. The one sacrificed himself for the nation. All right, so let's, the second half of Mark's gospel, the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. I'm going to go through a couple points. First of all, the opposition to Jesus leading to his arrest and death starts early. As I said, there are five controversy stories. There's a, a series of miracle stories in chapter 1. Starting in chapter 2, we've got five controversy stories uh, the climax in the a, a second Sabbath controversy. So I want to look at a couple of these, right? Uh, dining with sinners. Let's let's look at that one. We we saw the healing of the paralyzed man, but in chapter two, verse thirteen, it says, "Once again, Jesus went out beside the the lake. A large crowd came to him and began to teach them. As he walked along, so Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee. He saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth." Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. Now, this is shocking, right? Jesus, the rabbi, calls a hated tax collector. Tax collectors, as I'm sure you well know, were hated um, by the Jews because of their duplicity with the Romans, because they're also known as notorious cheats. They would, they would collect, the Romans gave them leeways to how much they could collect, and so anything above and beyond what the Romans required for taxation, uh, the tax collector could keep for themselves. And Levi... Um, is, is, so is one of these hated tax collectors. Um, Jesus then in, receives an invitation, evidently, from Levi to eat at his home. And Levi invites his friends, tax collectors and sinners. 
So while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. His disciples were there. Um, and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And this sets the stage for Jesus' ministry. As he comes, he says, The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and receive the kingdom. Re repent and respond. Repentance is necessary. Recognition, acknowledgement that we're sinners. The religious leaders have nothing to, to repent of. They don't believe that they're sinners. Jesus said, well, I didn't come for you anyway. I came for those who recognize their need of me. Only people who are sick need a doctor, right? Even if you have the coronavirus, if you don't believe you're sick and you don't go to the doctor, you're not going to get any, any help, right? So it's acknowledgement of our, of our need of him. So other controversies, this climax is then with a healing on the Sabbath. Um, turn to chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. The second he, um, Sabbath controversy, the first one was the one we talked about picking grains. By the way, the, verse, the, the chapter divisions is all wrong here, right? This, the, the, series of, the chapter divisions, of course, are added later. And, and the series of controversies ends in chapter 3, verse 6. It's, that should be the end of the chapter right there. So I don't know who. Sometimes they say that they did this on horseback. Someone did this on, when they were setting out the verses and the chapter divisions. So Jesus went into the synagogue. A man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse him. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. This is interesting. If I were Jesus, I would have taken him around back. And, you know, I see these religious leaders who, who want to trap me in my words. I would have taken him around back, healed him quietly in the back. Uh, but not Jesus. He says, stand up in front of everyone. He's directly now, he's directly challenging the religious leaders. Um, Jesus says, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? But they remain silent. Again, back to the, the previous question. What's the Sabbath for? It's to benefit people. Is it, which is better? To leave someone unhealed, which is evil, we could say, when, if you have the ability to help them, or to help them, right? Um, and then he says, though, he, he ups it a notch, to save life or to kill. Now, it's interesting. The man has a shriveled hand. He's not about to die, right? So he's not going to save his life. He's going to heal him, right? He's going to do an act of good. But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply disturbed at their stubborn hearts. Stretch out your hand, he, he said to the men. He stretched it out and the hand was completely restored. Verse 6 then. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Heavy irony here, right? What is Jesus doing on the Sabbath? He's healing a man. What are the religious leaders doing on the Sabbath? They're plotting murder on the Sabbath. Which is, which is better to do? Good or evil? To save life or to kill? They're plotting to kill. He heavy irony there. So early controversies, early opposition to Jesus' um, Jesus's ministry. Um, and then starting at, immediately after this episode, Jesus calls the, appoints the twelve. So it's like Israel is, the, the religious leaders of Israel are rejecting him. What is Jesus doing? He's reconstituting Israel. He's reestablishing, if you will, a new Israel. He appoints the twelve. And then we get this division of Israel between what we call insiders and outsiders. We haven't talked about this yet, but Mark loves a literary device called intercalation. Intercalation is where a story begins... And then that story is interrupted by another story, and then the story comes to conclusion. And the two stories um, mutually interpret each other. They have the same basic theme. Mark does this about six times, and the first one is right here, and I want you to see what happens. Um, verse 20, Jesus enters a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Okay, now, Jesus is so involved in ministry that he ha doesn't even have time to eat. Has that ever happened to you? Right? You get so busy with what you're doing, you, you just your, your health maybe suffers. They're concerned, so they're going, Jesus is crazy. He's working way too hard, so they leave Nazareth to come to Capernaum to pick him up and take him home, give him some rest, put him to bed, give him some chicken soup, you know, have him get some, get some sleep. So they think, they think he, he's crazy, right? The story ends there because they're on the way. They're on the way from Nazareth to Capernaum, and the religious leaders approach him. Teachers of the law who came from Jerusalem said he is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons he is driving out demons. 
So what do they do? They come to Jesus and they accuse him of casting out demons by Satan's power. The religious, um, Jesus responds, and, and we get this, this remarkable statement of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. First of all, he says, a kingdom divided itself cannot stand. Satan would be crazy to cast out his own demons. So there's no way Satan is casting out his demons. But then he says, verse 27, uh, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. So he says, Satan would never cast out demons, but look, what's happening is I'm tying up Satan and I'm releasing Satan's captives. And then he says this, Truly I tell you that people can be forgiven of all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. And this is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? We debate this issue. Well, Mark tells us right. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. What is happening here? The religious leaders have seen Jesus' miracles. They've seen his healings. Who's accomplishing those healings in Jesus' life? The Holy Spirit is. They've looked right at the work of the Spirit. And what do they say? They, they attribute it to Satan. So they look straight into the light and they turn to darkness. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is looking right into the light. All the revelation you're going to receive in life, basically, and turning to the darkness. So at this point, the religious leaders seal their faith. Now, we're talking about from a literary perspective. We don't know that every individual Pharisee at this point completely rejected Jesus. But from Mark's perspective, the nation represented by the leaders has sealed their faith because they reject. They looked right into the light and they've turned to darkness. I think that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, when you look into the light and ultimately and finally turn to darkness. Now, we never know that when that happens in someone's life. So we, we, don't, we don't know. You can't say you've blasphemed the Holy Spirit, therefore you're, you're lost forever. You can't, you can't say that um, because you don't know one, one's heart. But in this case, they, they've, they've sealed their fate um, by rejecting the Spirit's work. At this point, then, the family arrives. Okay, So that this is the other side of that intercalation, that sandwich structure. And what does Jesus say? Look at this. Then Jesus' mothers and brothers arrived, standing outside. They sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. And Jesus says something shocking, something incredibly insulting in this cultural context. Who are my mother and brothers, he said. He looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus completely and radically redefines spiritual relationships as not, not the physical family you have, not the physical nation of Israel in this case, but all those who respond, who, who respond by, does, by doing God's will, by responding positively to the kingdom of God. So here's this intercalation or sandwich structure. You see, Jesus is rejected by his own. It's almost a commentary on John 1, where it says, He came to his own, his own did not receive him. Jesus' family thinks he's crazy, so they start to head towards Capernaum. The religious leaders reject him. Jesus' true family then, uh, Jesus identifies spiritual relationships, those who do God's will as his true family. Now I want you to see, because what, what follows then is explainable based on what we've just seen. It's one of the hardest passages in Mark's Gospel. Jesus is teaching in parables. He starts teaching in parables in chapter 4. Parable of the sower and so forth. His disciples come to him and say, why do you teach in parables? Um, and Jesus says something shocking. Jesus' teaching in parables immediately follows the Beelzebub controversy. Um, in the context of Jesus' identification of his true family as those who do the will of my Father. And Jesus explains why he te speaks in parables. From Isaiah chapter 6. To you has been granted the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside. Now in the previous episode, who was inside? Who was outside? Do you see that? The... His disciples are inside. His family, those physically related to him, are on the outside. But those who are outside, they get everything in parables in order that while seeing, they may see and not perceive. While hearing, they may hear and not understand. Lest they return and be forgiven. Jesus says, I, I'm telling parables so that they won't understand. So that they won't get it. We say, what? That's not fair. It's only fair in the context of what we've just seen. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. They've rejected, they've looked straight into the light and they've turned to darkness. So what does God do when people turn intractably away from him? He takes their rejection and he turns it into a success. He accomplishes his purpose through that rejection, right? Um, that's Isaiah chapter 6. Let me jump ahead. To those open, 
to his kingdom message, the parables illuminate the meaning of the kingdom. But to those who through their hard-heartedness reject the message, the parables hide the truth. And so Jesus is going to use the rejection to accomplish his purpose. And of course, the rejection is going to result in his crucifixion. So everything has changed. The nation through its leaders are rejecting the Messiah. Their fate is sealed so that God now hardens their heart. And that recalls for us the, the episode in Exodus, right? Did, did Pharaoh harden his heart or did the Lord harden Pharaoh's heart? Yes, right? There's one of those, those yes answers we were talking about, right? I, I won't go through these, but in Exodus, it's like Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. The Lord hardened his heart. What's happening here? There's decisive rejection, so God says, I'm going to use that rejection to accomplish my purpose. So Jesus says, I'm going to speak in parables now so that you won't get it, so that I will ultimately accomplish, accomplish my, my, my purpose. So he's going to use their rejection. All right, jumping ahead now, crisis in Jerusalem. I'm going to move through this, this last section here um, uh, briefly. The crisis in Jerusalem begins with Jesus' triumphal entry in Jesus enters Jerusalem in chapter 11 in fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Now, up to this point, we've had this messianic secret, right? Jesus says, keep it quiet, keep it quiet, keep it quiet. Now he comes in riding on a donkey, right? And he intentionally does this. He intentionally fulfills Zechariah 9.9. He tells his disciples, go get this, this colt and donkey colt, and I'm going to ride it in. And everybody watching this goes, we know this passage, right? We know this passage in the Old Testament, Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Your king comes to you, righteous and right and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus publicly is revealing his Messiahship. And when he gets to Jerusalem, he does three things. Well, he does two things, but it's another one of these intercalations. He, he leaves Jerusalem, and the next morning, he curses a fig tree. Now, this is another one of those problem passages in Mark's Gospel, right? The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus is staying in Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seen in a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. So, so Jesus, up in the morning, he forgot to eat breakfast, right? Hasn't had his coffee. He's hungry. He sees a fig tree. He goes over there, right? It doesn't have any fruit. Why doesn't it have any fruit? Mark tells us it wasn't the season of figs, right? Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. So Jesus curses this fig tree. And... I think it was Bertram Russell, one of the great opponents of Christianity, who said, how can we believe in a, you know, that Jesus is, is good when he curses a helpless fig tree? So at first sight, this looks like a very odd thing to do. But then what does Jesus do? He goes into the temple and he clears the temple of money changers, an act of judgment against Israel. Right? On reaching Jerusalem, he begins to, to drive out uh, those buying and selling, saying, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it into a den of of robbers. The next morning then, he, the, the withered fig tree is discovered as dead, right? Rabbi, look, Peter says, the fig tree you cursed has withered. So what we have, we have another one of these sandwich structures, judgment against the temple and its sacrificial system. What does the fig tree represent? Jesus is performing a parable here, basically, by cursing this fig tree. The fig tree represents unfruitful, a f unfruitful nation, right? Jesus clears or cleanses the temple judging the nation for its unfruitfulness. They were meant to be a light to the Gentiles, right? Instead, the, the, the house of God for, for all nations, the house of prayer for all nations, has become a den of robbers. And so the fig tree is discovered withered. What's going to happen to Jerusalem because of the rejection of God and the Messiah? So another one of those intercalations. And it's in this context that Jesus tells his last parable. I want you to see this because this is so powerful. It's the parable of the tenant farmers. He then began to speak to them in parables. Now, up to this point, what's the purpose of parables with reference to those who are responding positively, right? The parables illuminate the truth of the kingdom. To those who've rejected, the parables hide the truth. So he begins to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Now, every Jewish person listening to this would immediately recognize this parable because this story comes right out of the Old Testament. It's Isaiah chapter 5. So in order to understand it, we've got to understand the Old Testament, right? I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press. This begins as a love song in Isaiah chapter 5. My beloved had a vineyard and he cared deeply for it. He loved that vineyard. He, he cared for it. 
So when Jesus begins this parable, a man planted a vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, everyone goes, we know this story, right? So what happens in Isaiah? The song of the vineyard turns from a song, a love song, to a judgment oracle. He looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Remember the fig tree. What was the problem with the fig tree? No fruit, right? Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I've done for it? I looked for good grapes, but it yielded only bad. Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge. It will be destroyed. I will break down its wall. It will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated. Briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. He's going to judge the vineyard. Then he gives the interpretation. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are the garden of his delight. He looked for justice. is a play on words in Hebrew. Mishpat. But saw bloodshed. Mishpat. For righteousness. Zedekah. But heard cries of distress. Zedekah. Woe to you who had house to house and joined field to field. So here's, here's the meaning of the parable in Isaiah. The owner is God, of course. The owner of the vineyard. The vineyard is Israel itself. The problem is bad fruit. They're not producing fruit. So God's going to take away their protection. Their protection. Um, and is going to allow the Assyrian Empire to conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. That's the context in Isaiah. Now Jesus tells, starts the parable the same way, but then, then switches it up. Right? Instead of um, simply saying that, that um, the vineyard produced no fruit, it says, then he rented the vineyard to some farmers. Who are the farmers in this case? Who was Israel under the care of? The religious leaders. Went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. Right? Now, um, so, so, so the owner is sending these servants, one after another, each of them are getting abused. Um, at this point, he had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him, last of all, saying, they will respect my son. Now, is that logical? But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, threw him out of the vineyard. Now, now, all of this is illogical, right? You've sent all your servants, and the servants have all been abused, so if I send my son, they'll respect him. Well, that's not what you would expect, right? It seemed crazy. For God to send his son to die seems, seems crazy, right? The tenants say, this is the heir. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Is that logical? Suppose you're renting an apartment, right? And you haven't paid your rent, and the owner sends his son to collect the rent. And you say, if I kill the son, I, I get to keep the apartment, right? right? But that's what the religious leaders think. If they get rid of Jesus, this rival, they're going to have the kingdom to themselves. They're going to have Israel to themselves. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. So here's this parable of the vineyard modified by Jesus. The owner again is God. The vineyard once again is Israel. The problem, the tenant farmers are, are the, I'm sorry, the tenant farmers are the religious leaders the servants are the prophets who God has one by one sent. The son is Jesus. The problem is rejection of the Messiah, rejection of the kingdom. The results, what's going to happen? The destruction, he's going to come and he's going to kill those tenants. The destruction of the temple by the Romans. So this is an allegory of what's happening in Jesus' ministry and ultimately what's going to happen, right? And then, and then a new temple from the uh, rejected cornerstone. All right, let me just close out this parable with this. Jesus says this, Haven't you read this scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. A rejected stone from the temple is going to become the new temple of God. Look at how the parable ends. They looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. What's the purpose of parables? You see the irony here? Right. The purpose of parables is to blind their eyes. But now what do they do? They, uh, they, they see it. They understand. They comprehend the last of the parables. Because of that, they fulfill, and then they, they fulfill um, what the actions of the tenant farmers in the parable is. All right, so two sides of Mark's Christology. The mighty deeds of the powerful Son of God, and then the suffering role of the servant of the Lord. Um, the last section of the notes, and we won't go through them, but the last section of the notes really 
um, talks about our response or the disciples' response to that, following the path of the servant uh, discipleship in Mark's gospel. And, and uh, that goes through these three cycles of, of um, where Jesus um, predicts he's going to suffer and die. The disciples demonstrate some act of pride. Um, and then uh, Jesus teaches about cross-bearing discipleship, climaxing then in Mark 10, 45.